as we flew right over O'Hare, we, we are approaching it now. Uh, there you can see the turbulence in the air. And as we flew right down 32 right, the runway to the northwest, which the departing American Airlines DC-10 had just taken, you could see debris on the runway. It had lost uh, a portion of the engine. It would be, in my estimation, it was the right engine. It was on the right side of the runway before takeoff point on the runway when apparently it was una the pilot was unable to abort his takeoff. Now there you can see the runway uh, as we approach it, long 9,000 feet, plenty of room for a great big airplane like a DC-10. And of course once a plane is committed, uh, there are no brakes to stop it in the air, there are no uh, sails you can pull out or anchors to, to stop it. You have to commit yourself once you're in the air and Again, now we're just presuming, but uh, with, with that engine or a portion thereof gone, this, uh, this you can see is, is uh, the rest of O'Hare to the south, and now the cameraman Bob Cosentino pans over, and there was the active runway at the time of the accident. And in the, uh, in the background, the, the plume of smoke from the smoldering debris. Uh, as I started to explain, once the pilot was committed, he had to use all of his resources to try to keep the plane airborne. Apparently he was, obviously he was unable to do this, uh, for what reason we, we do not know, because uh, as all of the eyewitnesses and our reporters have said, uh, he, he banked steeply to the left and, uh, uh, and crashed directly in. Now, again, a presumption on my part, but if you look out in the, in the background there, you see the fuel tanks, which would have been a, a major inferno had the plane crashed there, and then just in front of those, you start to see rows and rows of the mobile homes. There were thousands of people in those homes and this pilot uh, crashed in the only available open space between the end of that runway and those obstacles. Uh, here I started to use my presumption that he may have done so deliberately, being aware that he was not able to keep that big plane airborne. Now all this time we're, we're proceeding over the, over the airport having been cleared directly over O'Hare, which is a very unusual uh, procedure because of the uh, nature of the traffic in that facility. There were about five other helicopters in the air, so we had to be very cautious. And uh, now we're approaching the scene. You've seen it at ground level. As you get closer, as we get closer, you'll see a scorching pattern in which it appeared to me that the nose of the airplane went in first and then literally threw the fuel and parts of the plane forward from the impact. It's as if the, an inverted arrow. You see the point there where the flames are still burning. That's apparently where the nose hit, and then it just fans out uh, at 30 degree angles, black charred earth. Uh, as Jim Gibbons was saying, there's only one very noticeable or familiar piece of an airplane, and that's uh, the large engine. Uh, I believe it was the tail engine because it is large and, and part of the tail assembly. And then we could make out over in the vicinity of a couple of the uh, trailer homes, a piece of the fuselage. You could see some of the little windows, but that was it. There was nothing to indicate that this had been a plane crash. It was totally charred. There's a better shot now, still burning. And it's my understanding that uh, they are now pulling back the uh, rescue and safety forces from that area for fear of another explosion, a natural gas main. They say, and it's still over there on the runway, as I understand it, that the engine fell off the plane. That's, that's the right engine of the, right of the plane. Uh, I was told right. Right engine of the plane that had fell in the plane crash. Full of fuel because it was a long flight, so you'd get that's why this huge explosion. Did they mention anything at all about the high winds off the end of the runway nothing, here? Nothing. It's, uh, the only person that I've talked to who is an official of that was Mr. McAvoy, National Transportation Safety Board, and said that it is a very unusual thing to see an engine fall off a plane. American Airline crews who were coming in saw it happen. Never saw anything like it before. Did you get any additional information about uh, anybody injured on the ground? Just anything the three like that? Injured. Just the three. The three. As, as we know, I mean, it's very sad over there. You, know, you can't go on the other side of that fence. What was your reaction when you first saw that? I bet a lot of people were looking forward to a nice long weekend and that there's going to be uh, 200, 300 very broken hearted families tonight. It's very sad to start your weekend or start your night or even have to realize that some weren't even in their cars yet, probably from dropping members of their family off and hear on the radio that there's nothing left. It's very, very sad.
what, what agency is the city of Chicago? That's Mayor Byrne, Mayor Jane Byrne, who has just completed about a... No more than a standard uh, size office building, about that approximate height. It should have been a lot higher than that at this position. We're outside the airport grounds. That plane should have been uh, yeah. a thousand feet or more, perhaps, probably even at that so. time. It's probably so. It's, uh, it came down so fast, it's amazing, the massiveness that came down with literally, I'd say, with a three, four second time frame. What did you do after that? Did you try to... be some time, we understand, until the FAA gets here. They're flying in, I would believe, from Washington, D.C. at this particular time. Uh, Commander DeLeonardi told us that they're going to be here at about 9 o'clock tonight. Until that time, the scene will be managed here by the Chicago police in conjunction with the Cook County Sheriff. And uh, you see lined up there uh, uh, a, uh, the, the, uh, the squad rolls, which will be removing the bodies. Uh. When we have heard that, the, uh, that an engine fell off on the runway, the plane went into erratic maneuvers, tipping up with the wings vertical to the ground, and that the plane then crashed into this uninhabited area, which you see now in these taped aerials, at an area near Higgins and Elmhurst Elk Grove Village. This is an old abandoned airfield used for the training of Chicago police canine units. There the neighborhood uh, going home. Can you describe for us what you saw? Yes, I saw a very strange effect. I saw a cartwheel effect of the large jet plane, much like you see when you have a small plane when you're a child. And uh, the wings were uh, vertical and uh, the plane uh, literally had torn through the wires there and lay down in the field and I saw some fragments fly and ran to see a trailer just west of the uh, main scene on fire and I don't know exactly how it started but uh, it, the plane did not directly hit the trailer. It was an impact and all. Elmhurst Road, the confluence of Elmhurst, Higgins, Tui. Uh, that is about the area where it occurred. It's, it's an abandoned area, uh, an old abandoned field. It's an uninhabited area. Uh, and through the merest uh, good luck, good fate, good fortune, what have you. Yes, that's exactly what they're doing. The, the grim task of recovering the bodies of 279 people, I guess the count is now, Jill. Bodies all over this area, in the field. Some of them all the way up to the buildings, which you can't see now. There are a couple of buildings uh, a little, little beyond the fire trucks and the police vehicles that you're looking at now. As soon as it collapsed and it hit the ground, the spark set off the jet fuel, and this whole place was nothing but a sheet of flame. Thank you, Officer Delaney. Mary, there, there are American Airlines spokesmen out here now, and I talked to some, and I believe you attempted to talk to some earlier. And they aren't telling us much here. Apparently, all the reports are coming in to our news stations or are being given out by American Airlines people at their offices. But out here, as of now, we are getting no reports from American Airlines spokesmen. It's, it is consistent, Jerry, with what they say happened. If an engine fell off the airplane, obviously, it's connected with fuel lines under very, very high pressure. And uh, that fuel would have been, in fact, uh, flying out of the airplane at the pressure that it would normally be at. Uh, I couldn't say uh, exactly what the fuel flow would be, but it would be extremely high. It would be like a, a high-pressure hose with fuel uh, uh, just flying out of it. Now, if the plane is going through this kind of cartwheeling action that uh, Mr. Bliss described for us, that, that fuel would then be sort of in an egg-beater effect there. It would be spraying all over the place. All over. But, you know, that... I think that uh, the truth is that's kind of an incidental thing because when it hit, it would have burned anyway. And the uh, chances of anyone getting out would have been pretty remote. A number of people this afternoon have mentioned the fact that it is a rather windy day. It was windy out there. Would that have been a factor at all in this? I really don't think so. Uh, we, we take off under windy conditions constantly. And that airplane is, is very stable, uh, much more stable than most. And uh, with the kind of wind we had today, it, it would have been no real problem to the pilot to uh, get that airplane safely off the ground. It was obviously a, a number of other things that occurred that created that. Also, one other thing we might add is that uh, some Cook County units uh, equipped with portable lights, these big Klieg lights they use for uh, opening gas stations and that kind of thing, and for rescue work, are being brought into place now. I can't see one right right this moment, but a few minutes ago uh, were being brought into place. And it seems to me they'll probably rope uh, this area off more securely than it is now and continue to work through the night, I assume, to uh, and get all the evidence they can while it is as fresh as it is. We are told that the area where the plane crashed was once called the Ravenswood Airport. It preceded O'Hare out there. 
ironically, there is a, right in front of me, about 25 yards away, a small private aircraft uh, which was sitting on the ground here. Uh, I don't know uh, if it was a remainder from the old airport or somebody's private plane that they left here or what, but it was destroyed in the crash too. And for a moment, we thought it was part of the larger plane, but it is not. A figure, death figure of 276. That one has been repeated from several sources, and we assume that it is somewhat close to the accurate figure. Jory? Jim, we have word now that arrangements are being made for notifying the families of those passengers on board Flight 191. The Red Cross is taking calls right now at this telephone number, 440-2000. That's 440-2000 to call the Red Cross for more information about the people on board that Flight 191 bound for Los Angeles. In addition to that, an information center for relatives is being set up at the Elk Grove High School which is located at 500 West Elk Grove Boulevard in Elk Grove Village. Bill, as we reported to you earlier, there have not been any fatal air crashes involving commercial airliners since December 1972. As you indicated, that was the last time that it happened, December 20th, 1972. Ten people were killed, 15 were injured at O'Hare Airport when a North Central DC-9 nearing takeoff speed of 140 miles an hour sheared the tail off of a Delta Convair 880 that had just landed. The conditions that night it was fog shrouded at O'Hare International Airport when that incident happened, December 20th, 10 killed and 15 injured. Earlier that month, on December 8, 1972, near Midway Airport at 70th Place and Lawndale, 45 people died, and you're seeing uh, visuals of that uh, tragedy that occurred, as we indicate, at uh, 70th Place near Lawndale, when 45 people were killed in the crash of a United Airlines 737. It lost power trying to commit to Midway Airport and crashed. Among the victims in that mishap were Congressman George Collins, TV reporter Michelle Clark, and Mrs. Howard Hunt, the wife of the Watergate figure. Later on, the investigation, a lengthy investigation, blamed part of that tragedy and what they termed that the pilot had not reacted properly to the use of wing flaps and the absence of what the investigators called good cockpit uh, discipline. Prior to that, we had a crash in December 1972 at O'Hare Field when a uh, North Central airliner plowed into a hangar on a night but around the 28th of December that year where a drum and bugle corps was practicing and that resulted also in some fatalities but uh, that's been the scene recently we haven't had anything for six and a half years until today of this magnitude Roger Field has been we've got some statistics on the plane from McDonnell Douglas its manufacturer the loaded plane weighs 425,000 pounds you're gonna find this very interesting the engine only weighs about 10,000 pounds or less which means the engine actually occupies about 2% of the weight of the plane an inside source at McDonnell Douglas tells me, I called him at home, he tells me that the, end, the plane, the DC-10, is designed to take off regardless of whether one engine is operating or even if that engine has fallen off. So that they can take off this plane, he says, by design, even on one engine, although that has never been tried. Now here is a model of a DC-10, an exact replica, and here's how it would look taking off. The engine would fall off. And from the observer accounts we've seen so far, the plane must have tipped and then headed into the ground like this. The pro this is the second crash in 1,494,472 takeoffs since the aircraft's introduction in 1971. The first crash was a Turkish airline flight near Paris in 1974 that killed 345 people. Uh, now, the um, fuel capacity of this plane is 145,000 pounds. That explains a lot of the combustion you see. Back to you, Bill. Roger, let's... Uh... Good evening. 270 persons were killed this afternoon when an American Airlines jumbo jet crashed just minutes after takeoff from Chicago's O'Hare Airport. It was the worst U.S. air disaster, almost doubling the toll from a Pacific Southwest Airlines crash in San Diego exactly eight months ago. The DC-10 Flight 191 was bound non-stop to Los Angeles. According to witnesses, the plane lost an engine just moments after takeoff. An American Airlines spokesman said preliminary investigation indicated the left engine malfunction. Witnesses said the engine dropped to the ground and exploded into flames as the plane began to roll over in the air. It crashed belly up. Much of the debris fell on some trailer parks near the runway's edge at Elk Grove Township. Some injuries were reported there. Area hospitals had been alerted to receive casualties, but later were told to cancel the alert. There were no survivors. All 270 persons aboard were killed. O'Hare, the nation's busiest airport, was shut down briefly, but some runways later reopened. Departing flights were delayed up to an hour.
An eyewitness described the crash. I talked to uh, the FAA and they said that the, uh, the one engine was laying back on the runway. He evidently lost it right on takeoff and he was trying to correct the problem as he came over Tui Avenue here. But then when the hydraulic system went out and the other engine died, he just lost it completely and crashed over here. So the plane actually came down perpendicular to the ground. Right. The left wing dug, dug a path and as soon as it collapsed and it hit the ground, the spark set off the jet fuel and this whole place was nothing but a sheet of flame. Thank you. CBS News will present a special broadcast on the air crash tonight at 11.30, 10.30 Central Time. For the GSA, as a matter of fact, he's here on a training course with the GSA and was riding a bus right along the runway as uh, the aircraft uh, uh, crashed. His name is Dennis Wazulowski, is that right? Wazulowski, right. he couldn't be named Smith. Yeah. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, please tell me what uh, you saw. We were on an entrance ramp at the very end of the runway and I uh, cast my eyes over at the aircraft. I happened to just to like to watch airplanes take off. And the airplane made the turn down the runway, began to accelerate, and the nose came up. It would have then appeared to me that the pilot had, in fact, committed himself to the flight. Uh, at which point I saw a piece of metal, which I certainly don't know what it was, fly in the air at the, what would be the pilot's left rear. Um, immediately at that point, something began to stream from the left rear portion of the aircraft, uh, fuel, vapor, or something of that sort. He continued to accelerate and, in fact, gain altitude. Uh, because of the perspective, I can't be sure, but I would say he was probably about 500 feet in the air, uh, at which point he just began, it seemed as though he had lost all power. Uh, he fluttered in the air, so as to speak, without movement, uh, began to bang to the left, and he just started to roll over. Uh, at that point, it was obvious that there was nowhere for him to go. He was going to go down, and um, he was over on his back, uh, kind of upside down, uh, in this perspective to me. Uh, I didn't see the actual impact because there was a building between my point of view and where he went down. Uh, after that, it was just a f massive fireball, and that's all that I saw. There was no indication of any flame or explosion on the aircraft before Not at all. Before it, all it except for vapor down. trailing from the left rear portion of the aircraft. Uh, at that point. Uh, it was obvious that there was no way for him to not to take off. He was probably two-thirds or better of the way down the runway at that point. And he just continued right on up until he lost power and began to bank to his left and roll over. Uh, you're here to catch an airplane. I'd like to ask you how you feel about flying right now. There are a lot of passengers inside thinking the way you are, I think. I'm a little scared. Uh, but in reality, I, I guess uh, if you can believe all of the figures and the statistics, it's safer to fly than any other means of transportation. It is a major holiday weekend and I still want to get home. Uh, and I guess I'm going to fly on American at about a little after 8 o'clock tonight back to Albany, New York. That month under the December 8th, 1972 crash, we had a, uh, the other previous collision was... portion of the aircraft that you were able to recover. Well, we have, of course, two engines out here. We have the two right out here in the field and the number three that was thrown further over. And we have uh, the two main gear uh, that we haven't identified as left or right. And the other gear, then it's back there over in the old Ravenswood Airport hangar area. I think our viewers would be interested to know if you could estimate for us the time from liftoff to impact here in this field. I would say in the area of about 45 seconds. That's all, 45 seconds. Uh, yes. Uh, it's hard to conceive, perhaps a minute. An impending emergency. Some of the best eyewitnesses are American Airlines employees who were at a hangar near the takeoff runway. They saw the airplane coming down runway 32 right. The airplane apparently made a normal takeoff until it was a few feet off the ground, and they then saw the number one engine, which is under the left wing, fall off the aircraft. They saw fuel streaming out of the leading edge of the wing. The number one engine is out on runway 32 at this time. It's being moved to open the runway. The engine was removed from the runway. O'Hare Field was closed for a few minutes following the crash, but soon reopened. Eyewitnesses recall the grim events. And the plane sounded funny as it was going overhead. And then when it went down, it's like a sonic boom when it hit, and then all the smoke came up, and then you heard an even louder boom. 
And so I just ran out of my house and I saw the smoke and I ran over. I kept hearing like popcorn popping, only really loud. I was leaving my office and uh, I heard an explosion and I looked up in the sky and I saw a uh, flame almost reaching over the office. The remains of the dead were put in body bags and taken to a nearby hangar, which is serving as a temporary morgue. The next step, the grisly process of trying to identify the dead. Chicago's Cardinal Cody visited the scene to pray for the dead. Also on hand was the city's recently elected mayor, Jane Byrne. It's a terrible sight. Did you come out here as the commissioner was just saying, you know, that you, you come out here thinking, you know, you're going to be of help. The best. 20 crews of doctors arrived here within, I guess, minutes, and you don't need them. Counts as to the exact number of dead have been fluctuating slightly since the crash, but whatever the final count, it will be almost double the number killed in the previous worst air disaster in U.S. history. That was nine months ago to the day, when 144 perished over San Diego in a collision. The plane's flight recorder was recovered intact, and it will be examined to see if it can shed any light on why the engine fell off. Although there's a takeoff or landing from O'Hare Field every 30 seconds around the clock, there hasn't been a fatality here in a commercial crash since 1972. Don Webster, CBS News, Chicago. The DC-10 model, model might help explain what was happening. The plane was traveling at about 200 miles per hour, between five and 600 feet off the ground. At that point, one of the three engines, for reasons yet unknown, came off. The plane begins to tilt, begins to bank sharply, begins to decline. One wing hitting the ground, the front of the plane going into the ground, the plane collapsing, bursting into flames, and disintegrating. The trouble with that explanation is that it does not answer all the questions. The DC-10 is built to fly when one of the engines fails. Why didn't this one? And pilots are trained to fly and to handle engine loss. So if one fell off here, why didn't Flight 191 simply gain altitude and get out of trouble? No one knows, but the consensus among pilots interviewed by CBS News is that, as one of them put it, there's got to be something more involved here, that the plane simply would not flip over just because one engine fell off. They speculate that something else happened, that perhaps the plane's flight control system was also damaged. So for investigators, the basic question is why the engine came off Flight 191. Whatever their findings, they probably won't bring much consolation to friends and relatives of the victims, as Jackie Castleberry reports. From the crash site, the bodies were taken by police wagon to the temporary morgue at a nearby American Airlines hangar. The bodies will remain there until examined by the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office. Meanwhile, at the O'Hare Terminal, relatives and friends wait behind these doors at American's First Class Lounge. She is not a record on that plane. I wanted to find out if she's on this thing. Many of those waiting relatives were still at the airport when flight number 191 crashed. Jackie Castleberry, CBS News, O'Hare Airport. Tonight, CBS News, a CBS Chicago affiliate, has literally been flooded with calls from passengers on other DC-10 flights, calls complaining of engine problems in those flights. Thus far, no response from the airline about all those calls. After an event so sudden, so terrible, and so final, very little can be said. Perhaps Chicago's Mayor Jane Byrne summed it up best shortly after she arrived on the scene. A team of 20 doctors and nurses, she said, got here within minutes. They were all ready to help, but there was nothing they could do. Roger. It was a tragedy so enormous that it turned one of journalism's maxims upside down. The theory is that the death of one person is somehow more compelling because it's more comprehensible than the deaths of many. But on this day, when the first American to be executed against his will since 1967 died in the Florida electric chair, even that event seemed overshadowed by the awful scene in the deserted airfield near Chicago and the shock effect reached halfway across the continent to Los Angeles, which was the plane's destination. Terry Drinkwater has that story. American 191 was scheduled to land at Los Angeles Airport at 4.39 p.m., one of hundreds of full pre-holiday weekend flights heading west. When word of the crash reached here, the arrival TV screens were black for a few seconds, and then the words, 191 Sea Agent. American employees told those who had come to meet relatives, loved ones, friends, the stark fact, a crash and no passengers survived. No, none. American quickly set aside a private lounge, a place usually reserved for those happy moments when a flight arrives and people greet each other again. 
This time, the doors were closed. There was a place for people to be alone with their grief. Parents for their children who were on the way home to Los Angeles from Chicago for Memorial Weekend family reunions. Young people grieving for their fathers and mothers coming to California for vacations. Many here learned of the loss from television and never came to the airport or heard the news en route to Los Angeles International on the radio and turned around and went home alone. Only 50 or so came to gate 42 where the American jet was to terminate. And here, they learned that flight 191 ended moments after it left the ground 2,000 miles away in Chicago. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, Los Angeles. Eyewitnesses said that one of the plane's three engines fell off and landed on the runway during takeoff. But as Bob Fall reported earlier, investigators noted that the plane should have been able to fly with the remaining two engines. Why it didn't will be one of the questions experts will try to answer. Richard Roth reports from Washington. Within hours of today's crash, federal investigators were on their way to Chicago. There's no way to tell how long an investigation takes. This has the appearance of having complex mechanical aspects to the incident, and I think it's going to take a little while to put all the pieces back together. The FAA's primary job will be to determine if the DC-10 may have had some structural or design problem, a flaw that could affect the safety of the nearly 300 McDonnell Douglas jumbo jets still in service. Tonight, consumer activist Ralph Nader called for the immediate grounding for inspection of all DC-10s, saying that until the cause of the Chicago crash is known, it is the only prudent thing to do. An American Airlines flight from Los Angeles to Chicago in August of 1971 was the inaugural passenger run of the DC-10. Since then, the planes have been involved in at least three serious accidents, including the deadliest one-plane accident in aviation history. That was the March 1974 crash of a Turkish Airways DC-10 shortly after takeoff from Paris. 346 people died. A faulty cargo door was blamed for the crash, and repairs were ordered on all other DC-10s in service. In November 1975, a DC-10 operated by Overseas National Airways was engulfed in flames during takeoff from New York's Kennedy Airport after a flock of birds was sucked into a jet engine. The passengers were safely evacuated, and the FAA later ordered modifications to the plane's engines, manufactured by General Electric Company. And in March last year, the takeoff of a Continental Airlines DC-10 from Los Angeles was aborted when three tires blew. Two people died in the accident. Questions about the plane's safety were raised as recently as last September when Airline Pilots Association President John McDonnell charged before a congressional committee that the General Electric engine on the DC-10 had not been fully tested before it was approved by the government. Although the DC-10 is designed to fly on just two engines, a government safety expert tonight said the jet might have been fatally crippled by severed fuel lines and loss of hydraulic pressure when the one engine ripped away from the wing. The National Transportation Safety Board hopes to pinpoint the cause of the crash by analyzing two so-called black boxes, like these from last year's San Diego crash. Those from today's crash have been recovered. If they have not been damaged, they should contain recordings of the voices in the cockpit and instrument readings during the last seconds of Flight 191. Richard Roth, CBS News, Washington. The investigators also will be trying to piece the plane back together to try to learn what caused the crash. It will not be easy. The rubble is scattered over a wide area, much of the debris perhaps impossible to recover. Chris Kelly is at the crash site now. Roger, under the glare of floodlights here, the disaster workers are still going through the pieces of Flight 191, still recovering the bodies from the victims down there. The actual crash site now resembles something of a graveyard. There are a variety of stakes placed throughout the area showing where the bodies were found, bodies that were later placed in bags and taken to a temporary morgue. Pieces of the wreckage are still smoldering tonight. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board have been here since late afternoon, hunting for clues that will explain and clarify this disaster. This crash site is near O'Hare International Airport and lies beneath the flight path of departing planes. And in the distance, one can see the lights of planes in the landing approach pattern. It is an eerie scene at best, with views of pass with, uh, uh, within view of passengers on departing flights. 
At this point, it's impossible to uh, estimate how long it will take to answer the scores of questions posed by the crash of Flight 191. One official here say it, it might take two weeks just to clear away all the wreckage. Roger. The names of the dead in today's crash are not being released until the next of kin are notified, but tonight American Airlines released this partial list. Anywhere took place on March 27, 1977, on the Canary Island of Tenerife. More than 570 persons died when two 747s collided on the runway in dense fog. 570 people. Again, federal investigators are on the scene in Chicago, beginning their probe of today's crash of an American Airlines DC-10 that killed 272 people. NBC News will continue its complete coverage of this disaster. It was published last month. Today's crash is the world's third worst air disaster. The worst in history occurred in March 1977 in the Canary Islands. A Pan Am jumbo jet, a KLM M 747 colliding on the ground. 592 dead. The second worst occurred in March 1974 when a Turkish DC-10 crashed on takeoff near Paris. 346 dead. Until today, the worst U.S. air disaster had been last year's collision in San Diego between a Pacific Southwest 727 and a private plane. 144 dead. Explanations and investigations of air crashes do little to ease the pain and grief. It was back in 1956 when 128 died in the Grand Canyon collision that Commerce Secretary Sinclair Week said that despite the tragedy, Americans were still safer in the air than they were on the ground. Statistically, that was true then and it's true now, but it was also an inadequate epitaph then and it is inadequate now. I'm Roger Mudd, CBS News. Good night. East here in Chicago. Again, we are seeing the scene as a, I viewed it this afternoon from a helicopter in that stiff wind as we circled the scene just a half mile from the runway, uh, which was the departing runway for Flight 191. To describe it is to say that it is nothing but charred earth. The grass was burnt, and the fragments, except for a portion of the tail and one engine, the port, the, uh, it was so small that there was nothing to indicate that there was anything of humanity there. Certainly no seats, no luggage, no indication that over 270 people had been there in the air just moments before. It's the old uh, Ravenswood Airport and the hangars uh, that had been used uh, are collapsed from the heat and the explosion. Just beyond them is the trailer park. And incidentally, that is the Tui Avenue trailer park, which we mistakenly identified as the oasis, the confusion being that the two are only about a block apart. Those hangars probably served as something of a firewall to keep the flames and the destruction from spreading into the areas inhabited by literally thousands of people. The smoke was visible from the loop some 20 miles away. And it slowly turned from black to gray. And the rescue units on the scene were not needed. 
Now we have news about the people waiting at the other end of this tragedy. It is a tale of two cities, and those are the people at Los Angeles International Airport. We go now to our sister station in Los Angeles, KABC TV. This is Jim Mitchell at Los Angeles International Airport. Friends and relatives arriving to meet passengers aboard American Flight 191 were met by this ominous message on the television screen in the terminal. They were escorted by American Airlines personnel to what the airlines called a sympathy room, isolated from the rest of the Memorial Day holiday traffic. Airlines personnel kept the vigil with them behind guarded doors as the long waiting process began, waiting for the list of names to be sent from Chicago each one painstakingly checked. People are very sad. It's a very somber, sober area in there, and which you could certainly expect. While many continued to arrive at the airport, many who heard the news on radio and television didn't come. For those, American Airlines began to make the notification by telephone. The names of all the passengers and crew members on the flight list will not be released to the public until much later, until after American Airlines is certain that the next of kin have all been notified. And those names, as we understand, at least the complete list, should be available sometime tomorrow morning. Well, for one last visit to the scene, the tragic crash scene, and for the latest developments, and they continue through the night, we return again to our reporter, Jim Gibbons, who has been there since the accident occurred, who is joined now with John Kalia. Near O'Hare, Jim Gibbons and John Kalia. And joining uh, John and myself now, Joe, we have Langhorn Bond, the head of the FAA, as I mentioned about 45 minutes ago when those helicopters were circling above, that it was probably the FAA team from Washington, and in fact it was. Mr. Bond, you are here with the team and invest investigators. Where do you begin? Well, we begin with basics. Pick up pieces, match, match them together, analyze metal fragments, look back over design chart, inspect the inspection records. We're here to uh, find out what caused it. Uh, it's obvious to everybody who's here that nothing can be done but try and trace down the cause of it all. An engine falling off a DC-10 aircraft. That's an incredible situation. That's right. What, what do you suspect at this point? Well, there's, you know, I've, I've tried to guess in the past, and I've always been wrong. So uh, the best thing to do is to track it back, incident by incident and piece by piece, until you find the cause of it. I don't know why it came off. It obviously came off. It's an un extraordinarily rare occurrence. It hardly ever happens. One thinks of metal fatigue, or, or uh, was the engine switched perhaps lately? Had they just changed it? To... Well, we haven't looked at the maintenance records yet. That'll be done tomorrow. American will provide that uh, to us and to the safety board. Premature to speculate. The airlines have been put under great pressure with United on strike uh, and running uh, extra service. Uh, could this have been the case of just trying to get too much out of equipment to uh, to satisfy the public's need uh, for transportation? Well, I, I would I would speculate the answer to that is not. There are periodic overhauls and safety inspections at 100-hour intervals, and whether they fly them more or less, they're done at that periodic time. I would not think that's the case. There is a flight recorder. You have recovered it. When can we expect to hear the conversation in the cockpit between uh, the tower, perhaps, for the clues uh, of why? Well. The flight recorder is in the safety board's possession. Uh, our plane, the FAA plane, will take it back for the safety board to Washington tomorrow morning. It will take about two days to, to have all the data and the flight print out, and uh, after that, the board will make it available to the public. Neil Callahan from the FAA office here in Chicago told me that he was in possession of some recordings, some information that passed between the control tower yeah. and the crew, right. and that they asked if the plane wanted to return, which suggested yeah. that they were in uh, trouble immediately. Yeah. Well, those are our own tapes of our air traffic control. Those are over in the FAA tower. Uh, I'm not surprised. I understand the controllers could see the aircraft was in trouble and uh, tried to help uh, as, it, as it became evident that it was crippled. This scene of devastation behind us, you've been to plane crashes before. What, what do you say about this one? Each one is worse than the last that I've been to. I never become accustomed to it. It's a terrible, shocking thing. And uh, all of us who are in the safety business in aviation, when we see something like this, we go back over what we've done in the past. Maybe if we caught something or found some flaw, 
we could have prevented it. It's a very introspective process for us. We, we, it should be pointed out that aviation has had an outstanding safety record. Uh, when can you compare the, the millions of miles of, of travel? This, of course, does not uh, satisfy what happened uh, this afternoon. You were in San Diego, which up until now was the worst yeah. disaster. Yeah. Uh, you had a different situation there with the small plane, right. uh, with uh, pilot uh, error, judgment was wrong. This case uh, just seems to be uh, a mechanical malfunction that caught this crew by surprise, and thank right. God the pilot uh, obviously veered it off yeah. and spared uh, perhaps a thousand lives. Well, it came very short of a very highly populated area. We're really out in a field here now. Thank uh, the good Lord for that. You're right. Aviation has a remarkable safety record. I wish it were perfect, and it never is. What about the DC-10 now? Is there is there anything that you should be doing? Are you contemplating any action about looking at these planes to see if uh, or, or temporarily grounding them, for example? Well, we won't know what to do until we analyze the crash. It, you can't give an order until you know what to say. So that's what the safety board and the FAA and the manufacturer and the airline are all working together to do. If something should be done right away, we, as soon as we know it, we'll do it. You're starting to go through the ruins, assemble the pieces. Yeah. How will that be done, and, and how long will it take? It, it, it's a very painstaking process. We put them together piece by piece, and uh, the safety board's investigators and our people are really marvelous experts. Uh, the way a little piece of metal bends and breaks, whether it's crystalline or sheared, in evidence of that kind comes the finding of cause of a crash of this sort. Recovery of the body is, bodies is, is not your field of, of, of endeavor here, no. but you must know something about the count. Uh, how, how far <laughs> along is it? Well, I was told that uh, there were 257 bodies recovered at this point, but, but the uh, Chief Dobbs told me that. That's not a very accurate count. There are no survivors whatsoever, of course. Give me your reaction. We are coming to the end of, of, of uh, our newscast. Uh, your first reaction when you were told, how were you notified, and, and just tell me what you felt. Well, our communication center at the, at the FAA headquarters, of course, is in touch with the tower, and I was told within, within minutes of the time that the aircraft went in. Uh, it's, it's a terrible feeling of depression, and, uh, but the way we cure these problems, these incidents in the future, is to analyze them and work hard do all we can to find what caused it and then and then cure it in the future so that it won't happen again. That's the, the more pe more time people are in accidents like this, the more professional and analytical they become and the more determined that you just find the cause, don't let it happen again. But that doesn't help uh, as far as your emotions. You no, know, the emotions are very, very difficult to control, but they're nothing like the emotions that the people who have lost their families in this crash, those are the people who have the worst impact of it, and certainly my heart and sympathy goes out to them. Mr. Bond, thank you very much. Joel and Fahey, John Kalia, and myself here at the scene. A long, emotional day for both of us, John covering the events over at the trailer park, and uh, me here at the scene. John, thank you very much for coming over, too. And, uh, well, what, what else can we say? You can say. There's nothing you can say. It happened, and thank God it wasn't worse. Joel, Fahey. Thank you very much, Jim and John, for an excellent job. We have at least a partial list now of those who perished in the flight and...